Welcome to the Exam Study Expert Podcast, helping you ace your exams at school and university through the psychology of high performance and the science of studying smarter, not harder. It's my pleasure to introduce your host, the Cambridge-trained memory psychologist and exam success coach, William Wadsworth! Hello and welcome to the Exam Study Experts podcast. Today we're kicking off a little mini-series on study tips for neurodivergent students. Over the next couple of weeks, we'll be covering ADHD and autism, but we're starting today with dyslexia, with the help of two world-renowned experts, Jen Clark and Dr. Gavin Reed, who join us today to share their deep insights on the ups and downs of dyslexia and what you can do as a student with dyslexia to overcome the challenges you might be facing, but also to capitalise on your unique strengths. Even if you're not someone with dyslexia, what I love about many of their suggestions, uh, and this also goes for next week's episode on ADHD with Eric Tivers, um, is that so many of these tips are really great tips for anyone, even if we don't have ADHD or dyslexia. And this conversation, I definitely took away a couple of really juicy nuggets that I'll be referring back to in future. I'm also joined by my colleague, Dr. Alex Hibble, throughout this series. Alex is exam study experts, school speaker, and also leads on private one-on-one coaching for school-age students. I focus my one-on-one coaching more on university students and professionals taking exams. Alex is with us to add her perspectives and help guide the conversations throughout. And because I know you'll probably be wondering if I don't mention it, just to say, uh, Jen and Gavin were joined by a very friendly dog uh, whose claws you could occasionally hear tapping away on the floor at their end. Uh, unfortunately, there wasn't much we could do about that, either at the time of recording or in the edit. Uh, so you'll have to give the odd little bit of uh, tapping away in the background. Uh, hopefully it's not too distracting. I think it should be OK. Um, so without further ado, I'm very excited to introduce our guests today. Let's meet them and get into today's conversation. I'm Dr. Gavin Reed. Um, I'm an educational psychologist. Formerly, I was a classroom teacher. I'm also a parent of a young boy, in fact, who's got uh, special educational needs. So I've been involved in this field for many, many years. Also, I'm also a chair of the BDA, British Dyslexia Association, a accreditation board, and a trustee of several dyslexia charities. So I'm very much involved in this field. And I also feel that study skills and effective learning is really one of the key areas of trying to overcome the challenges associated with dyslexia. So I'm very delighted, I'm really delighted to be able to do this uh, podcast. Well, it's a pleasure to have you here, Gavin. Uh, Here is Jen Clark. Uh, my name is Jen Clark, and uh, I am the co-founder of the Reading Lab here in Vancouver, Canada. And I am an Orton Gallingham uh, practitioner or reading specialist. Um, for the last twelve years, I've been uh, teaching one-on-one uh, support, uh, reading, writing, any kind of language skill you could think of. And my uh, practice uh, ranges anywhere from students in kindergarten to high school and even some uh, students in university. I've also been involved in teacher training here in Canada as well. So I have had uh, quite a bit of experience helping a neurodiverse population of students as well as helping teachers get effective teaching skills. So thank you for having me. Well, thank you both for being here. You're both very welcome. I'm really excited for today's conversation. Alex, where are we going to start? So let's kick off and just think about, in your own words, what is dyslexia? And specifically, what is dyslexia beyond what most students might think when they hear the phrase, you know, just in terms of reading difficulties? See, I I see dyslexia as essentially a challenge or a difficulty with processing information. Now, usually that comes out in written form. But it could be other kind of information as well. It can be instructions. If you're given a lot of instructions at once, you may have difficulty in organizing it and remembering it and sequencing it. So it's really how the information goes comes in, how you retain it, how you actually organize it in your mind, and really how you process it and what you do and how you could kind of relate it to previous knowledge and how you understand it. That's all the input. 
And then and it's the cognition, which is the thinking and the processing, and then the output, how you display to other people that you know this information. Now, a lot of students with dyslexia know a lot of information, but they've got difficulty in the output. They've got difficulty in displaying it, usually in written form, actually. But it doesn't have to be. They've, so they Sometimes uh, people misunderstand that they might think, oh, they can't do this or they have difficulty with this. But in actual fact, they can do it. It's just that they don't know how to do it. And that's why study skills and effective learning is so important because it, te- it really, tr- you train yourself how to actually display your competence in a better way or in a more effective way. So it's essentially a difficulty with reading and writing and possibly spelling, but there's other things like organization, planning, sequencing information, uh, memory as well. A lot of things which we would uh, classify as being executive functioning challenges. And that's uh, kind of the hub of the brain in a sense. So it really does, uh, it can have a big impact on your performance in exams and your performance in coursework. And that's why it's so important to have a course like this and to have effective study skills under your belt so you know how to learn. Yeah, so just just kind of um, adding to what Gavin was saying, um, I think for a lot of people they have this kind of concept of dyslexia as being a one thing and just being an entity, like one thing. And, you know, really kind of piggybacking on what Gavin was saying is how it's it can coexist with other things like executive functioning, ADHD, uh, working memory, processing, and all of these things, you know, kind of tie into what dyslexia is. And dyslexia is not going to look the same in every individual. It's a very kind of personalized thing. And, you know, some people may exhibit more of one thing than another, but um, really what we want to remember with dyslexia is our students have incredible strengths. And so what you're going to find is lots of strengths in our um, neurodiverse students. And what we want to do when we're, when we're talking about study habits or test taking is we want to encourage them to use those strengths because there are challenges like processing differences and working memory, but they can all be overcome with strategies to do something more efficiently. But we need to teach that explicitly. And that's one thing that I think we really need to think of is that explicit showing and overlearning so that they've got it in their pocket, they know it so Mm -hmm. that um, they can study effectively. Yeah, if I could just pick up one point Jen's made about the individual, I think it's very important. Dyslexia will affect individuals in different ways. So in some students, you know, they may have a lower self-esteem because they have have difficulty throughout school uh, and they feel unsupported and it will have an impact on self-esteem. But other students, it may not. You know, you often hear, oh, dyslexia equals low self-esteem. It doesn't always. It depends on the individual. It depends on the sport that they've experienced. It depends on their experiences of learning as well. There's clearly challenges with something like dyslexia, but I think it's always a really interesting just to kind of pick up on that point you were making about the the strengths as well. And we'll get into in a minute, I'm sure, some of the strategies that we can use based on those strengths. But yeah, I thought it'd be really interesting just to, to, to take a moment yeah. to celebrate what, what are some of the, the strengths you have yeah. as someone with dyslexia? I mean, it's taken a long time over the years for these strengths to become, you know, socially known or widely known Uh, and I remember in 1993 I wrote a chapter called The Other Side of Dyslexia which was exactly that looking at because I'd read so much about the negative points about dyslexia and I felt look there's a lot of strengths and I mean there's a there's a phrase I often use that people with dyslexia can see the unseen sometimes they could see things and do things other people can't and that's why a lot of uh, High tech companies and other kind of companies, computer companies, actually want to employ people with dyslexia because it gives them an advantage. It doesn't just replicate what's been going on before. They will think outside the box and they will think of a new avenue, of a new, a new kind of way of working out things, and maybe a new product as well. So uh, there's a lot of positives, as you were saying, a lot of positive aspects to dyslexia. 
Yeah. In my own practice, I've noticed a lot of my students have exceptional visual skills. Um, And so, you know, thinking about design and art, I mean, it's amazing to think of some of the skills they have. Some of our uh, students or some of our neurodiverse population have exceptional uh, vocabulary skills, speaking skills, communication skills. There's lots of examples of people throughout history who who have been exceptional motivators and speakers. And so, you know, when we think about a person, we really have to think about tailoring something specifically to their strengths so that, you know, they use what they're very good at as as a kind of a balancing ability to kind of make something accessible and really, really shine through through what they can do. So it's really important, therefore, that they develop their own strategies. Now, you could look at books on study skills and they'll tell you some good study techniques. You can't, that might not be applicable to everyone. I mean, that's kind of a a general, it's a good, I mean, a lot of them are very good. I'm sure your program is excellent for study skills. But students have got to look at it and say, right, what's best for me? They've got to know themselves. And I always think the starting point is the learner their own, they've got to know something about their own learning style, their own learning preferences, their environmental preferences. Do they prefer to study in a library where it's really quiet and nothing happens? Or would they prefer to study in a cafe where there's a bit of buzz and noise and background music? And, you know, you might find that some, many people with dyslexia would prefer the background music to the quiet environment. So it's a question of knowing yourself. And that's why at university level, I think students should be acquiring that self-knowledge. They should have had it by that time. Uh, And that self-knowledge helps you choose, look at study skills programs and and say, right, I could try this. And the thing is, it won't work right away. Like everything else needs practice. So you might say mind mapping. Now, mind mapping is a a really good strategy. Many people use it uh, for great things. You know, they do great things with mind mapping. They could study a whole physics curriculum with mind mapping. But the thing is, you've got to practice it. I mean, you might say, oh, I can't do that. I'm not very visual. I'm not very good at that. But it, like everything else, if you keep just start with something small, then make it bigger and bigger, you'll be able to do it. So I think the key thing is finding something about yourself as a learner. Secondly, looking at all the kind of strategies that are around. And thirdly, selecting that are best for you and practice using those until you become competent at using them. Yeah, and I think that's a really important point, that idea of actually it does take practice when you're, we're accustomed to the idea of when you first encounter a topic at school, you know, you don't get it straight away, it takes practice. But study skills are also exactly like that. You know, just because a strategy, you know, at the beginning, the first time you use it seems a bit difficult and it's not like strategies you used before, doesn't mean that in, you know, with practice, with repetition, that actually that strategy, you know, it might be that thing to unlock that next level of knowledge, that next grade boundary for you. So I think that's a really important point, that idea of like patience and perseverance when trying new strategies. Yeah, we, we recently did a talk with the, at the Dyslexia Show um, in Birmingham this year, and we actually did a course on study skills together, didn't we? And um, one of our slides was talking about the whole buzz of strategies. And something that Gavin always wants to make kind of clear is that it's exactly kind of what Alex was saying, is that that metacognition of using a strategy and recognizing it as a strategy. So you practice it so it becomes a habit, and then it later just becomes a skill set we use to do something. And, you know, from my own experience, what I've found is that teaching a habit or a strategy or like a, a study skill, exactly like Alex was saying, is it takes time. You can't just expect that someone's got it in their back pocket. They've got to have multiple, um, all of our students have to have multiple approaches or time to kind of use that habit and and really think about their own learning. Gavin writes extensively about metacognition and how you've got to stand back as a learner and recognize, oh, this worked really well for this test, but I tried it in this situation and wow, it just, it didn't work. And so what I need to do is really think about um, how I could adapt that strategy or maybe even adopt a new one because, you know, not all tests are equal. That term, metacognition, is really reflecting on your learning. It's really thinking about thinking. So when you do something, you say, oh, you're so relieved you've done it, and you've got 
got that essay or assignment away, you've got to really think, well, how did I do that? What did I, what did, what work there? How did I get the information from the book? Did I just read the summaries of the book at the end, the main chapters? And how did I manage to put it into that form for the essay? So just thinking, right, and thinking about the strategies. And a lot of students don't, I mean, when I was a student, I didn't do that. I just wanted to get over with, like, like many people. But you've really got to think about the process of learning rather than the product, the process that you go through. I think that's very important. And maybe we could talk now about some specific strategies. I think that'd be great. One of the... Um, Things I think is very important when I think back to myself as well as a learner when I was studying at university, and I recommend it a lot for people with dyslexia, is practice practice using summaries. I think if you could summarize anything, uh, then you, you understand it. So when you've got, say, you, you look at your notes, you've been to a lecture, you've got a page of notes, see if you can summarize that into three or four lines. And that might just be main points. You say, right, what's a, just even if you had four key points, the, the more you could reduce the information to key points, the easier it is to recall and the easier it is to understand as well. In fact, you're going through that understanding process. I, I was once given, giving a talk recently and I managed to summarize my notes into the back of a postage stamp. <laughs> Uh, and that's uh, that took a lot of uh, took a lot of time to do that, but and that's what you want to do. You want to summarize your, you know, you're studying for an exam, and you've got all these pages, probably books and books of notes, and you want to really summarize it into just some key points. And once you once you do that, then you could go for a walk and try to say, well, what were the key points? And these were the key points. If you can't remember them, when you go back home, look at your notes again, or even have a piece of paper in your bag and you could refer to it. But just having those key points all the time is important. It's important for learning. It's important for retaining information and recalling information as well. Yeah, yeah, I think that's, that's good, I think, because summarizing, as Gavin was saying, is it's really kind of speaking to the fact that you've processed the information. A lot of times you might write a note, but you haven't actually processed the information. And so really, when you think about studying, it's not just copying something. It's not really just a bunch of dates or formulas. It's about a process of understanding what your notes mean or understanding how they're connected or how they're related. So summarizing um, in any kind of form is really kind of that deep self-check that you've actually understood and retained and processed something. And so, um, you know, how you show your summaries could be different. Like you could, you could, a lot of my students who are great visual artists, I, I get them to draw pictures so like uh, working on a timeline for history, why don't you pick five images that you think speak to, I don't know, causes of World War II or whatever it is that you're doing, draw those pictures and then in your own words, tell me what those pictures mean and how they're related. And just by using something that's non-word related really helps students get away from this, oh, I've got to copy pages and pages and pages of notes because to show your understanding, you really don't want to do that. It's really about the recall and the process. Mm -hmm. So you could use a mind map, you could use diagrams, you could use arrows, you could use cartoons, drawings, you can use a poem, whatever helps you retain and process or summarize those main points, I think is, is what you need yeah. to use. We're just pausing the main conversation for a second uh, because Alex and I had some extra little thoughts we wanted to throw in at this stage for you to help join up uh, Jen and Gavin's comments about summarization uh, with some of the messages you've probably heard elsewhere on the podcast about retrieval practice. This idea of you know condensing you know pages and pages of information into a short paragraph or trying to summarize a topic in a few sentences is also a really nice way of dealing with just the sheer volume and quantity of information that you, you know, need to remember for your exams. And often students report feeling really overwhelmed. Summarizing the information in this way can be a way of breaking down something that seems you know, an overwhelming vast amount of knowledge into a much more manageable, smaller amount of information. So as well as checking your understanding, it can also really help with you know, dialing back those levels of stress before you get towards exams. 
It's a great point. I would also add, just to link in some of these ideas about summarizing to something we talk about all the time, if we were to summarize our own expertise on a postage stamp, it would probably read spaced retrieval practice. One thing to make explicit, and and Gavin sort of, and, and Jen were kind of alluding to it in different ways, but the key is not just to summarize once or to summarize uh, you know, with with a kind of open book style, while you've got your lecture notes or your original class notes open, but to either summarize from memory, so you're writing out what you know from memory, or you are writing your summaries summaries in such a way that they are designed for you to test yourself or, or recall them back later. So, you know, either putting them perhaps on one side of a flashcard so you can kind of recall the key points to later date, test yourself on them. Or sometimes we we call we use the QA notes approach where you put your summary points down one side of the page and then you put some kind of cue or question down the left hand side of the page. So you cover up that right hand side, read the cue or question, and then you try and remember the the key points about a certain certain segment of the of the course. Um, or you know you practice explaining your summary to someone else. And again, that's another way of doing this retrieval practice pulling that information out of memory, testing yourself on what you know. And, and, you know, for everybody, no matter, you know, whether you've got dyslexia or not, that that's kind of at the heart of what it takes to get stuff to stick in memory effectively. It could be that you get out your phone and do, you know, can I talk about everything I know about this topic and can I get it down into a minute or a minute and a half, effectively making your own sort of miniature podcasts on a topic. And, you know, it's a great way of, you know, as Will said, like testing yourself from memory, doing retrieval practice. But it could also be a nice way when you, you know, several weeks later, come back to the same topic again. Maybe, you know, you're walking to the bus and you could just play those sort of one minute clips that you know, rattle you through that topic and just give you that structure of knowledge. So you kind of know where you're getting started from. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, listening back to your voice notes wouldn't be a way of doing retrieval practice. But, you know, what I often say to people when they're asking about using that kind of strategy, I'd say, well, you know, if you're walking to the bus and you can't do much else, you might as well be listening to something. Okay, it's not retrieval practice. You're not testing yourself on something, but it's otherwise just ed time. And you're now using that time, at least productively, it may not be retrieval practice, but it's still, you know, using the time much better than, than, than not at all. So I think that's a really, really good tip. Let's get back into the main flow of the interview. And when you're practicing that, it's really best to start with something quite small, but also something quite familiar. Don't start with something that really is quite difficult. You have difficulty learning something, something you know about. Say you go to a soccer game every week, you can start with your, the soccer game and just do a little mind map of that, the players, the score, the incidents. Just start with something very familiar to you. For young children, I often ask them to say what they did at the weekend, and I would help them divide that into you know, ent- entertainment, family, money, um, friends, and so on. And so they would be able to work that, you know, do a little mind map of that. So start with something familiar, and then work up to more complex and complicated topics. That's the same with everything, even taking notes and and summarizing information try to start with the familiar something you're happy with uh, and comfortable with and knowledgeable about and then you can move on i also think it's important i mentioned earlier in the podcast about environment i think it's very important to consider your environment because at school you don't have much choice you you, i mean that's it you take it or leave it you're in a classroom uh Whereas at home or when you become, when you get to university and you're more independent, which is also, it's a big change being independent as a learner, then you've got some choice. You've got choice over the food you eat often and you've got choice over where you're going to study and what you're going to study and how you're going to study and how many hours you're going to study. And I will say good studying is not, does not, is not measured in hours because it's not, a, you could spend I mean, I, this is what we find a lot. We've got students with dyslexia, say, and their parents often say this, that they really study so much, it's heartbreaking, and then they don't get very good grades. And I will say, it's not, study is not a time thing. It's a, it's a process. <laughs> you could use many hours or waste the whole lot and have nothing to show for it, or you could just use 30 minutes and get top grades in your exam. So it's really... Um, getting the right environment, whether it's a, a quiet, as I was saying, a quiet environment or a musical environment, music in the background, um, even where you sit. I mean, 
I found it difficult sitting at a conventional desk. I, I sometimes prefer walking around or moving around when I'm trying to learn something new. Uh, so just find out something about yourself. And you'll find there's lots of learning styles, questionnaires on the internet, and just it'll help you to find out what kind of learner you are, whether you like to learn even with the, with a friend. I mean, you often see when I sometimes sit in cafes, and I look at people studying, and there's often students, usually piles of students in cafes studying. And sometimes you do see two or three people studying together. And I thought, mm, I don't think I could do this, do that study with somebody else. But they have, some people find that effective. And people with dyslexia, they actually learn best through discussion. They, they just, once you've got some information about a topic, they want to discuss it. They want to say something about it. And that is an active form of learning, just discussion. You're being active, you're being interactive. And that is also a very effective form of learning for students with dyslexia. So working with another person, studying together with one of your friends, uh, or even three people or four people, could be good as well. And the same applies to tutorial groups. Tutorial groups, sometimes people dread them because they've got to say something and something significant. Um, and that could apply certainly to people with dyslexia. But it's, I look upon tutorials as a learning experience. You're learning from that tutorial, you're learning from others. They've got things that you haven't thought about, but you've also got things that they haven't thought about. And don't forget that that you you could actually contribute a lot to that tutorial group. So group discussion, uh, even peer, working with a peer, or knowing something about yourself and how you work as an individual. These things are very, very important as well. So Alex and I were, lo- were nodding along furiously in, in many parts of that. I think particularly when you were talking about uh, studying is not necessarily about the hours you put in so much as the quality of that time, mm. because our, our, our motto around here is, you know, it's all about studying smarter, not harder. So that's that's, that's right. That's, that's a good one, eh? So many interesting things here. And first thing is learning styles. You've mentioned that a couple of times, and I just want to dig under the surface of that just a little bit because here in the UK, when a lot of people hear learning styles, they're still thinking back to you know the old model of everyone's either a visual learner or auditory or kinesthetic and you know as as we've said on the podcast here before like a whole generation of psychologists has looked for evidence that that this is a real phenomenon that if you're a visual learner and you learn in a visual style you get better results yeah. and we've come up with a blank um so you know if if we're not talking about visual auditory kinesthetic stuff then then what what are we kind of talking about when we talk about learning yeah. style well you know I tend to move away from, as you were saying, learning styles is a very bad press. And uh, that's, that's okay. I don't mind that. Because I think the thing about learning styles is not cast in stone. It's flexible. And that bad press has probably emerged from people saying, oh, you're a visual, ordinary, kinesthetic, or tactile learner. Yeah. And, you know, that's, yeah. that's not true because you could be – you could vary at different times. I tend to use the term, instead of learning styles, I use learning preferences because everyone, you, I, everyone's got a preference, a preference for food, a preference for learning. A pref- We've got our own individual preferences, and you can't dispute that. People have got preferences, and I just want students to think about their own preferences for learning. It could be things like um, working together, so social learning. Yeah. As I was saying, working with somebody else or working on your own, whether you're uh, in kind of intuitive learner or whether you're linear, whether you want to learn, when you get a book to learn, you want to start by, say, the first page and you want to build up a picture, or maybe you look at the end first and get the overview or you read the cover, jacket cover. And some students need to get an overview. And I think that's a good tip for professors, actually, <laughs> but when you start lecturing, to give the student an overview of the whole field. Yeah, give that sort of map and then helps you navigate the yes. whole thing, doesn't it? Yeah. So that comes into learning preferences as well. Some people like to get an overview. Some people like just to start at stage one and, and work through it. Uh, even, you know, even things like um, your food, whether you like to drink while you're working or eat while you're working or whether you just don't eat, just work without any breaks. Um, even time of how, day. Time of day. Some people. Time of, yes, time yeah. of day comes in. Well, uh, that's a very important one. 
time of day. Um, I mean, at school, you've got no choice. You may do your reading. When you were a child at school, you were doing your reading, say, at 10 o'clock in the morning. Some people haven't woken up at 10 o'clock in the morning. I mean, you're lucky we're doing this podcast in the morning, and we're both quite, we're morning people. If you'd asked us to do this at 8 o'clock in the evening, would have probably, you would have got nothing nothing useful from us. <laughs> well, you, you and me both. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's really interesting and um, the, the thing about uh i guess kind of learning preferences segues quite nicely into the second thing i was i was going to ask about which is i think you were talking about this jen when it comes to you know some of the advice that 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 neurodiverse students you know students with dyslexia in particular get it sometimes seems like it's it's quite logical okay so so the written word isn't your strong suit you know you, you, reading and writing are things that don't come naturally to you so so let's let's try and let you know finding ways to to kind of come around that and, and lean into your preferences so you talked about kind of drawing pictures there i think that's one thing if your ultimate assessment is you know you've got a you know you've got a scribe there in the room or your ultimate exam is oral but that advice while it, it it's probably the best way for that learner to learn like at the end of the day some of those learners are going to be forced into the system we're faced with where they're going to have to do some writing and write written exams and, and whether that's the right thing or the wrong thing to be asking of those learners is a philosophical question for another day but but what would your advice be to to learners in terms of getting the balance right between learning in in the way that might be the best way for them versus practicing sort of in a in a, with a more kind of like getting that pragmatic practice of well, okay, ultimately I will have to write some sentences, you know, on exam day in 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 two months' time, and getting some practice of that because it it doesn't come naturally to me. Maybe I need to do more practice than than might otherwise be the case to make sure I I can do it on the day. You're right. So we encourage people to use their strengths, but then you're 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 saying at the end of the day something written has to come out of this, and so. Right. What you want to do is encourage people, as Gavin was saying, to find their um, their strength. So, for example, going back to my drawings, that's kind of the first step. And so when you, when you encourage somebody with study skills, you kind of approach it from a strength base. But then what you want to do is you kind of want to scaffold that or segue it into something like maybe some sentence frames. So they can practice using, for example, who, what, where, when, why. And they can actually get practice starting sentence stems. So you give them a sentence stem. So the reason for this is because, and they could practice filling in the rest. And so I do this when I teach writing is I provide a lot of sentence stems so that students can have a, uh, lots of practice. They can have lots of practice using those sentence stems before they actually use them in an exam situation. So a lot of times our learners, like a neurodiverse learner, might think to myself, they might think, oh, how do I start this? So a lot of times they just need encouragement or that little bit to start a sentence and have practice working with those so they can then apply them in, a, in an exam situation. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's also one of the key things also is reading the question and understanding the question. And, you know, especially in multiple choice questions, which are really, they're very, very challenging for people with dyslexia because there's so much to read. And they, they tend to, you know, multiple choice questions do try to trick students. Uh, and, they, and that's... that's not very fair on people with dyslexia who don't like to be tricked in that way. But, you know, I think what you've got to do with multiple choices, well, you certainly qualify for more time because you will need more time for multiple choice questions. Um, but you, once you read through it, uh, then you, there's always one or two outliers. You know, you might get four options. There's usually one or two. You say, well, it's not that, it's not that. That's fine. Now you're left with two, and that's a difficult thing when you're left with two. That is a time to reread the question and just read the question again and then say, right, okay, and then you'll probably come up with what you think is the right answer. Mm -hmm. But you've got to spend, when, when students get extra time in the exams, I always say, say if they get, I don't know, 45 minutes extra time, I think 15 minutes should be no pencil, or maybe you take notes, but just reading the question, reading the question. And, you know, I, I, I know I've read questions and questions and still haven't quite understood it and then realize, oh, that's what they're asking. And the questions do tend to trick people. I mean, I, th I think university professors take some glee in having questions that people could misunderstand. 
Um, so questions should be straightforward, but not, they're not always. So I think you can, you must spend a lot of time reading and rereading the question, especially in multiple choice, but not necessarily in, in any kind of question, any kind of um, type of question. And also, I've encouraged students to circle keywords. So find those key tip-off words that are going to really help you understand, am I understanding or interpreting this question correctly? And for example, if, if a question might say list four causes, you know, somebody might just list two. So really, it's looking at the question, circling the relevant information, and then, you know, kind of tailoring your answer specifically. So if it says list four reasons, Put four dots on the page so you know there's four reasons that need to be filled in. Um, if they're asking you to compare and contrast, you highlight those words. You write compare in a T-chart, contrast on the other side so that you're setting yourself up to answer the question in detail and give um, your answer has all of the check marks that they need. And so as Gavin was saying, sometimes questions are tricky or they're multi-pronged. So what you need to do is circle those relevant words and make sure your answer speaks to that. And that's where a lot of times students might lose information or marks is because they've only provided one reason instead of for, or they may have compared something and forgot to contrast. So really it's about, you know, interpreting the question, asking yourself, did I highlight all the key words? Taking time to think of how I might start a sentence. Oh, um, this is different because, you know, as like Gavin said, you can't just go and write. You have to think. I always encourage my students, good writing is thinking beforehand and then putting your uh, pen to paper because if you don't have time to think you you're, you know you may come up with half of the answer yeah i think it's a time thing whenever you sit whenever students have got a time limit they just write i know when i do assessments and one of the tests i use it you've got right for i think 10 minutes but i don't tell a student they've got 10 minutes to write i just want them to write because whenever i say oh you, uh, i'll give you 10 minutes for this i know they're going to they got really without even thinking. They got to start writing. I want them to think first and then write, as Jen was saying. Um, you know, one of the points I think we mentioned self-esteem, and if I was to think of one top tip, just one thing I would like people who listen to this podcast to go away with, uh, and that is this: do not compare yourself with others. Do your own work, your own way, in your own time, and you'll get your own results. You don't want to say, look at other people and say, oh, they've got, they're doing that. They're, it's, forget about them. Just concentrate on yourself because it's so easy, especially if you've got a lower self-esteem because you've had a lot of failures, to look at somebody else's uh, work or to listen to somebody else's tutorials and say, wow, they're fantastic. Um, I mean, they might well be fantastic, but so are you. And you've got to think of your own work and what you can do. Let's face it, we only use a tiny fraction of our brain's capacity. So there's a lot of untapped brain there that you've got to access. And you can do it through effective learning, effective studying. And you can, it's amazing. I mean, I, I myself, I left school at 15 with no qualifications. I failed all the way through school. I had 15, no qualifications at all, and I went to evening classes and just worked, I say, just found out how to learn, really, because I wasn't taught how to learn in school. And through that, I through a different process of how, how to learn, I got uh, quite a number of degrees in my PhD. So uh, I didn't think, if you said to me when I was 15 or 16, or if you said to my teacher, when I was 50 or 16, this guy's going to get a PhD. They would say, don't speak rubbish. There's no way. But that's because I, I wasn't able to use my brain. I only learned to use it once I found out more about how I learn as a learner. And I think that's very, very important. So don't compare yourself with anyone else. I think that's great advice. 
Yeah, and I think that's a, a natural tendency to to do that. Um, another thing that uh, I always encourage my students who are in high school, it, it's it's really what Gavin was speaking to is knowing yourself as a learner. And I always encourage my students to offload, I don't know, maybe the processing or the working memory effort is like looking at yourself as a learner and knowing that they know the answers, but maybe sometimes getting a little frustrated with the amount of effort or time it takes to work through this process. So I found a lot of times my students with executive functioning challenges find writing incredibly frustrating because of the amount of time and steps it takes them to go from a from a beginning process process to an end product. And so I would say to them, hey, how can we offload some of this? Do you want to maybe put your ideas on your phone? Do you want to do you want to use technology like a mind mapping um, computer program? How are we going to make this less cumbersome for you to get the same result? And so that's using graphic organizers, that's using technology to offload some of that. And technology is not a crutch. It's a tool. And we want to encourage our students when they're studying, when they're producing essays, they, we want to encourage them to use it appropriately. And we have to teach them. So if it's a tool, again, it goes back to what Gavin's saying. We want to start you know, identifying when can we use this in our work. And we want them to start using it when they're grade five and grade six. So it just becomes a go-to when they go to, um, you know, start working or start studying. They've got that habit and it's, it's a skill now. And that's what they use to access things. And that's really important. I think what I love so much about, you know, much of your advice is it's, it's great advice, not just for, you know, neurodiverse students, but, but for us all, isn't it? You know, having a good routine that works for you and your preferences, breaking down uh, exam questions and, 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 you know, identifying the key bits. So you're not getting tripped up by things, uh, you know, as you were saying, Gavin, you know, not comparing yourself to others, you know, these are universally good bits of advice. These are really, really strong, strong tips. With the theme of neurodiversity, which really essentially means that no, you don't have a disorder. You don't have a difficulty. It's a difference. And you've got a learning difference. And it's everyone's different. And that's another, just one final point I'd like to make is one of self-advocacy. And, you know, usually um, you, students who are dyslexic have been assessed by university and they've got accommodations and they've got some support there. But you've really got to speak up for yourself. You know, if your lecturer has given you a lecture with no notes, you've got to say, look, I need notes. I need notes beforehand. I need to see what you're going to be talking about before you talk about it. I need to have it in front of me. And usually, normally student services at university, I, I used to work in one at Edinburgh, uh, they're very good. They, they make sure that, oh, you no, know, professors and lecturers uh, have got um, idea who's dyslexic and what they need in advance of the lecture and so on. But if that doesn't happen, you've got to speak up for yourself. Uh, and there's a lot more now in self-advocacy and advocating for yourself because dysle there's no stigma with dyslexia. It's a strength, and you've got to keep believing that it's a strength. For sure. From both myself and Alex, you know, thank you so much for for your for your time this morning and and your your your, your great advice on all these points. Um, it's been it's been great to hear, you know, a taste of some of your best ideas about some of these these topics. I guess if that's whetted anyone's appetite for for more, I believe you've got some published works and, and maybe other places you'd suggest people go. I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit about that uh, to to finish with. Yeah. Well, Gavin has done a book. Uh, how to Help series, uh, Effective Studying, which is a fantastic resource. Um, it'd be great if teachers read it, parents and students um, talking about, you know, effective ways and habits for studying. One of the books is on adult dyslexia. And I've really been thinking about university students all the way through that. We'll we'll put the links to we'll put the links to both those books in the uh, in the show description for anyone that's wants to go. Yes, and that's, that's that would be the really two main ones. Yeah, there's sure, also sure. Dyslexia Tools Workbook for Teens, which oh, yes, has so. a lot of it has a lot of activities, and through those activities, it actually speaks to a lot of the skills mm -hmm. we were talking mm -hmm. about. It actually, you know, thinking about sentence stems, um, summarizing, and it gives you. Uh, 
it gives you activities to practice with. So you can actually use that book if you're thinking about, oh, how do I summarize? How do I pick out the main points? How do I say something in my own words? There's actually quite a few activities in there that you could mm-hmm. use to practice uh, that. We're actually developing our own website, which should be live next week, so, yeah. uh, called The Reading Lab. Jim and I have formed a company here in Vancouver called The Reading Lab. Uh, and so we've got our own office quite close in West Vancouver. And uh, we've got a website coming on this, this next week, I think. Yeah, that be. has some of the resources yeah, on it. and resources will be on there. If they're interested, yeah. yeah. Fantastic. <clears throat> well, look, thank you both once again. Um, we'll, we'll pop that website in as well. Thank you very much for making contact. And um, I'm really interested in what you're doing because it seems it's something I didn't know about your, your organization, but it seems like thriving. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's fantastic. It's something that should have been there a long time ago. When I was a student, I would have done that. <laughs> Oh, well, thank you so much for the kind words at the end, Gavin. Uh, it was such a pleasure to speak to both of you and so many uh, really, really helpful tips and tricks uh, sprinkled right throughout that conversation. I know I've taken a lot of notes. Uh, Alex, what are your reflections? One of the thought, things I thought was really interesting was we went through sort of three things quite rapidly, um, talking about study strategies, talking about metacognition, sort of reflecting on what works and what doesn't work. And then also uh, Gavin talked a little bit about environment. And all of these three things sort of tie into that idea about being an independent learner. And I think this is sometimes, you know, when it comes to sort of GCSE year, A-level year, even, you know, transitioning from school to university, that idea of taking control of what makes sense for me, what works for me can actually be really difficult, you know, early on in secondary school, um, you know, in high school, teachers say like, oh, for your revision, make me 10 flashcards for homework. So you're used to being told exactly what to do and when. And so I think thinking about yourself as an independent learner, it's not just, oh, you know, I'm going to use my study periods to revise. It's actually thinking about this idea of reflecting on specific strategies. And it's not just, oh, I'm a flashcard person. It's, okay, this strategy works for this topic. This strategy works really well for this subject. And then also, where do I work best? And also, what time of the day do I work best? And all of these different prongs, you know, interact. Being an independent learner is about thinking about learning, not just in terms of the content, but how you're doing it, when you're doing it. And even, you know, with motivation, why you're doing it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I know there are one or two UK teachers uh, in the in the in the listenership. You may be familiar with the organisation, the Education Endowment Foundation abbreviation EEF here in the UK, uh, which does a really nice job of summarising the evidence on interventions that are helpful uh, in schools. And the intervention in their teaching and learning toolkit, they rate, I don't know, 20 or 30 different things that you can you can do to help raise standards in your school. And the number one thing that comes out as having the highest impact is metacognition. So this idea that uh, Gavin's been talking about and Alex was echoing of, um, you know, reflecting on how you learn and how you learn best and what works for you. And so definitely one of the things that hopefully this you get out of this podcast is just an encouragement to reflect on what's helpful for you, what's most helpful. uh, And, you know, each episode, I hope there are some things that you can take away uh, and apply and try out for yourself. Uh, Maybe as as Jen and Alex mentioned, uh, you know, it might not click instantly, you might need to try it um be a bit persevere with it a little bit to give it a good shot um but then over time you gradually assimilate this toolkit of things that work for you uh and uh, in the different circumstances um so thank you so much for joining us today i hope you've enjoyed this conversation we'll look forward to seeing you next week when we're going to have eric sivers uh with us to talk about adhd uh it's a fantastic conversation i'm really looking forward to sharing that with you in the meantime wishing you every success as always always in your studies. Wasn't that wonderful? If you're feeling inspired, why not leave us a rating and a review in your podcast app? It would make our day. Thanks again for listening and see you soon.